What is up, WAP? Good to see you guys. Um, we are jumping into revolution season. Um, before we get into the specifics of the revolutions, uh, we are in a new time period, which is 1750 to 1900. And 1750 to 1900 is a really uh, fun time period. It's a, a really exciting time period to learn about um, because we have three major themes that create some accelerated change in world history. Um, and the first one we talk about today, the Enlightenment is going to spur revolutions in the Americas and France. When we say the Americas, um, it's going to start with the United States, with the American Revolution. And that is going to lead to um, Latin America as well, where we're going to have the Creoles revolutions. Um, also, the American Revolution is going to lead to the major revolution in Europe, which is the French Revolution. Um, the, so when we look at the um, revolutions, what starts revolution season? It starts with the Enlightenment, these ideas about natural rights, um, which is going to cause many of our um, people, our citizens that are currently living under a divine king, to question the power of the king and question why they don't have more representation in their own government. The first revolution happens to create the United States, then it's going to move over to France, and then it's going to move throughout the world. The Creoles revolutions in Latin America, the Balkan revolutions in Southern Europe, and then the unification wars in Italy and Germany. So the Enlightenment, really the catalyst for all of these things, starting with the American Revolution. Then, of course, in this time period, we also have the Industrial Revolution, um, not caused by the Enlightenment, of course, but rather by new technology, which causes mechanization, doing things um, by machine that were once done by hand, which then comes um, into the growth of factories and this incredible change in economic, political, and social life. Um, that stuff we will get into uh, next lecture. And then, of course, the age of imperialism. This is our second age of colonization. We just went over our first one, which occurred as a result of the discovery of the new world and the movement into the Indian Ocean. Now we have a new age of imperialism. And this one is spurred mostly by the Industrial Revolution because we have all of these new goods. And so now we need places to um, sell those goods. We need new consumers. And thus, this is going to cause uh, new conquering in lands like Southeast Asia um, and, of course, Africa with the scramble for Africa. Uh, we have more key dates in this time period than any other time period. Um, the 1750 is the start of the Industrial Revolution in England. Um, that is uh, a big one to understand when industrialization starts to occur. 1776, that's our Declaration of Independence. Why that's relevant in this WAP course is because with the Declaration of Independence, that starts the American Revolution which of course is the start of revolution season is that is our first revolution um, in these in this era. So that's a big one. Um, 1842, that's the end of the Opium War. Um, that marks our start of the age of imperialism um, because the British come in and start the scramble for China. Europeans come in and look for spheres of influence there. Um, and this is gonna start um, a scramble for lands throughout the world, especially um, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Um, the Sepoy Mutiny, um, that represents the the end of the um, British East India Company control over India and the start of direct British control over India. Um, Meiji Restoration, that's the start of industrialization in Japan, and then the height of the scramble for Africa with our Berlin Conference. Um, really, the only one we discuss today is our Declaration of Independence and the Revolution Season. Okay, so the main idea is the 18th century is really our Age of Enlightenment. That's the 1700s. It's called the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. And, there, and we've seen that the Enlightenment is going to come out of a couple of things. It's going to come out of the Renaissance, which champions life on Earth and, and not just about living to make it to heaven. Um, and it's also the Enlightenment is going to come out of the scientific revolution, which championed the idea of just making discoveries through fact. Um, and not just accepting the old traditions that were always passed down largely by the church. And so we have these new thinkers, these philosophes that are going to come in and, and, and think about and then write about um, why the world is the way that it is and, and start to champion the individual rights of the common person. 
Um, the common person has the ability to reason, to think. Um, and so there should be more power for the individual. And let's, let's start to use reason over tradition to define things um, like politics, like uh, social structure, all of these things. And so what the Enlightenment is going to do is it is going to challenge the role of especially the absolute monarch. Um, in our last time period, 1450 to 1750, we saw the rise of absolute monarchs. We saw the rise of Louis XIV in France or the czars in Russia, right? And all these different examples around the world, the sultans or the shahs of the Ottoman Empire. This enlightenment, what it's going to do is it's going to start to question those powers of those absolute monarchs because um, – a, the individual is going to ask for more rights in their government, but also those absolute monarchs are, are deriving their power from God. They are divine monarchs. And so what the other thing the Enlightenment is going to do is it's going to say, well, um, is, is there evidence that God has given power to these kings? And um, because there is no such evidence, that is also going to take away some of the um, religious power from these monarchs and lead directly to revolutions. And so um, the big picture here is the 1700s with these new ideas of thinking, the age of reason, this is going to challenge the authority of some of the well-established conservative powers um, in the world, which are our divine kings and still um, our churches. So the Enlightenment, it is a uh, intellectual philosophical movement. Again, it grows out of the scientific revolution and the Renaissance. Um, when we talk about the scientific revolution, especially Francis Bacon with his idea of empiricism or that um, you need to use data to collect facts um, before you can make a conclusion on something um, because many of our leaders derived powers from things that could not be proven through scientific observation. Um, obviously, this is going to lead to a challenge of authority. Um, also in the time period, um, obviously applying reason to progress is a big one, reason, the age of reason. Um, but deism, deism is a new religion that emerges in the 18th century. Um, and deism is the idea that um, God, divinity has set up the earth created the earth and then once the earth was created uh created man so that man now has the ability to reason and think but once human beings were created then god stepped aside and allowed human beings to rule themselves and to and to run the planet and so this idea very connected to the idea obviously of using reason to um, dictate the world, but it also is going to um, challenge, again, the rights of divine monarchs because it's going to say, look, God created the world and created human beings and then no longer is giving divine kings any authority or power. And so, again, this is going to lead to revolution in that way. Now, we have two Enlightenment thinkers that are really going to set the stage for our 18th century philosophes. So as you can see from these the dates on these two men, they actually lived previously to the 18th century, the 1700s, but their work is going to set the stage, lay the foundations for the Enlightenment. One is Thomas Hobbes, and Thomas Hobbes was um, an Englishman, and he was uh, actually a, a pessimist. He believed that um, human beings were naturally dangerous and violent, and he said that life is nasty, brutish, and short um, unless human beings engaged in a social contract with their government. Um, what he believed is that human beings have a social contract every time they enter a government, meaning every time that they say that this is my king, um, they are giving up some of their rights. They no longer have the power to um, you know, influence their own political decisions because, of course, a king has absolute power. But by doing so, they know that the king is going to provide law and order and protect them from the naturally inherently dangerous human beings of the world. So he writes this in the book Leviathan, and he starts this contract that there is, starts the idea that there is a social contract between people and their government. Now, that idea of the social contract is going to be touched upon and talked about many different times. One such example is John Locke, perhaps one of our most famous philosophes. Um, and he writes the two treatises of government. And in it, he also talks 
about a social contract. Um, first of all, he says that every human being has natural rights, that each and every person have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. This is something that John Locke says, and of course it's then borrowed by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Um, but he is gonna take the idea of the social contract and he's gonna alter it, he's gonna change it. And he's gonna say that government exists so that it can protect the natural rights of human beings. And yes, human beings have these natural rights, but it doesn't mean that they have to give up those rights when they enter um, an arrangement with the government. In fact, he argues, John Locke argues, that the purpose of government is to protect these natural rights. And if they enter a agreement with a government in which the leader of that government becomes oppressive of these natural rights, then citizens have the right or obligation to overthrow the government. And this, of course, is a very revolutionary idea. And this is the sort of idea that our American revolutionaries are going to embrace when King George III starts to violate their natural rights. And so this is a clear link between how the Enlightenment leads to revolutions. Um, he also had several other writings. He talks about um, the concept of tabula rasa, which is the idea that children are born as, as completely blank slates and that um, wonderful thinkers can come from anywhere on earth. And it is not their ancestry or their race that influences intelligence, but rather their environment and how much education they receive. And so this was a, a, obviously a very progressive and, and very great mind, uh, John Locke. Um, okay, so our philosophes then are going to come in after these two start set the stage for the Enlightenment, and they're going to promote new new theories, new social theories, political theories, economic theories, um, and we have lots of philosophes that we have to break down and understand. The big idea of understanding them is to understand their their great achievements. For instance, Baron Montesquieu um, is all about the advocation of separation of powers. He believed that if one person holds a lot of power, that this is an invitation for tyranny, um, that not only one person or even one branch of government should be able to control all aspects of a society. And that by separating power in government, this means that there can be checks and balances on power so that not one person or one branch can become too powerful. Of course, this becomes um, a mainstay in the American constitution where we see our three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches. Um, Voltaire. Voltaire is a very, very important Enlightenment thinker as well. Um, he writes a social satire called Candid, um, and he is especially interested in protecting um, natural rights of citizens, especially when it comes to freedom of speech and freedom of religious liberty. He believes that no government should tell its citizens what religion to practice or that a religion is illegal in their state. And of course, um, this is at a time where almost every state is telling their citizens what religion to practice. This is one of the biggest reasons and why we had our huge religious wars like the Thirty Years' War in Europe in, in the 17th century, in the 1600s. And so Voltaire is coming in and he's saying that while now the, the religious fighting has stopped, still we see laws in place throughout um, all throughout Europe in which the kings have embraced a specific type of religion. He says um, that's not right, that every every state should allow all different religions to exist. And Voltaire, a, a close friend with Benjamin Franklin actually, is going to um, deeply influence the First Amendment in our U.S. Constitution, which of course is several things, but um, includes very conspicuously freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Um, another person, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, another philosopher that is going to add to um, these ideas of, of natural rights and civil liberties. He writes, um, again, he writes on the social contract. This is the third philosopher to reference the social contract here. And he says, the government uh, has an obligation to carry out the general will of the people. And what he's saying, if if a, a monarch is, starts to drift away from um, what the people want, the will of the people, um, that the government isn't doing their obligation. And so um, he expands upon John Locke's idea that if a government becomes oppressive, um, that it must be um, dealt with, that it must be eradicated. And he says the government needs to listen to the general will of its people. Um, we also have enlightenment philosophes, what we call physiocrats. 
Um, and these are philosophes that are going to uh, use natural rights and then apply it to economics. Now, in the time period 1450 to 1750, we just learned about it. This is our previous time period. Um, it's all about mercantilism. It's all about hev heavy regulation of the government by the state. Um, and what Adam Smith is going to do in, in his writings in 1776 is to challenge um, this idea that the government should become, uh, that the government should be so heavily tied um, to economics. And he said, every person should have the ability um, to engage in their own business ventures, their own economics, without the regulations of government. And so in his book, The Wealth of Nations, he says, let's get rid of mercantilism and let's allow free trade. Um, let's allow private ownership of land, private ownership of natural resources. Um, and the laws of supply and demand will help govern the economy. His idea that the government should be divorced from the economy is something called laissez-faire, which in France means hands off, to leave alone. He does not believe that the government should at all be regulating the economy as it's done up until this point. Um, and this is going to set the basis for capitalism. Now, yes, we have had private ownership of land previously, although in some places it was believed that the king owned all of the lands. So what this idea of capitalism is going to do here, promoted by Adam Smith, is we start to see that the emerging middle classes of Europe, we start to see more and more wealth coming into Europe, and we see more and more middle class rising to upper class with lots of money. Um, those middle class, now upper class peoples are going to start buying um, factories. They're going to start buying ownership of lands that control gold mines and silver mines and all these things. And so um, what Adam Smith does with his creation of capitalism or, or his basis of capitalism is that um, we start to see wealth inequality grow out of this as the, the emerging rich uh, out of the industrial revolution are going to start to control more and more of the land and more, more and more of the means of production, which of course is going to create debates over uh, if the government should come in and, and break down monopolies and give rights to the workers and to the people that don't have control over wealth and lands. But that, of course, is for a new discussion. Um, and then another revolutionary, uh, you could call him a philosopher, but he is very heavily tied, of course, to the American Revolution is Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine is uh, an Englishman, and he comes over to the Americas right before the um, American Revolution. He writes a incredibly influential pamphlet, the most influential pamphlet in American history called Common Sense. And in Common Sense, he is going to write in very simple language why um, the people of the American colonies should rebel against Great Britain. Um, he talks about King George III is a, a tyrant. Um, and he says, why, why are you listening to this small island 3,000 miles away? Um, no time in history has a land so large been governed by an island so small. Um, and then he goes on to make a really interesting argument where he says, um, Britain isn't the home country of America. He says, Europe is the home country of America because all over Europe, people fled to the Americas to populate the Americas, um, and they were running from civil uh, persecution or religious persecution. And what he meant was um, they were running from um, either they were practicing a religion that was illegal in the country or, or they didn't have any wealth or land for themselves, and so they ran to the Americas. And he said that still, um, they are still facing persecution from a tyrant overseas, this guy, King George III, who was taxing them without representation. And this really um, hit home with many Americans. And he is um, given the accomplishment of turning the average or moderate revolutionary into a radical revolutionary against Great Britain. Um, he also was a deist and he promoted and defended deism. Um, okay. So this becomes known the Age of Isms, also the 17th century, our um, Age of Enlightenment, because this starts debates over um, the role of individual rights and the role of change um, in this time period. Obviously, we're going to have some people that don't want a violent insurrection or change in the government. And the people that don't want change, and this goes through all throughout history, are going to be conservatives. That's what conservatism is. is it's, it's a resistance to change. It's a commitment to what's been currently going on, a commitment to traditional values. 
Um, and typically throughout history, conservatives are going to be people that don't want change because they currently have power. They're wealthier, they'll own land, or perhaps they are in the majority race or religion. And while the government may be persecuting against minorities of some time, um, they currently preside in power. And so they don't see the need to create change. Liberalism is going to be um, based off the idea that the individual needs protections from the government, um, that more individuals should have more says in their government, and the government should be used to promote equality before the law. Um, traditionally, if this is going to be our middle class or our poor, people that are in lack of power or aren't the majority race or, or religion are looking to get help from the government to be protected and have their natural rights protected. Um, we also see out of the age of enlightenment, our first um, major organized birth of feminism, um, because the enlightenment is talking about natural rights and how every being is um, equal and have these life, liberty and the pursuit of property. Well, then what, of course, about the women? And so we have an English writer, Mary Wollstonecraft, and she is going to say in order for women to have equality with men, uh, they need to have the same educational opportunities all throughout Europe and the Americas. Women were still restricted from attending school or becoming literate. Um, and therefore, she argues that women are not equal to men and they cannot be equal to men until they have the same educational opportunities in men. And so she writes a vindication of the rights of women where she argues at this point she becomes one of our most well-read and well-known feminists of the Age of Enlightenment. And this is actually going to inspire um, to American women to uh, sponsor and organize the Seneca Falls Convention, which is in upstate New York. Um, this is after the American Revolution, of course, we're in 1848. Um, and this is where we have two leaders, Lucretia Motts, who was a Quaker. She believes in all equality um, of men and women. Um, and so obviously she is going to be a feminist. And then Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was um, a New Englander, and she actually went out to attend the London Anti-Slavery Conference, um, only to find that when she traveled all the way over to London, um, she was denied a seat at that conference because she was a woman. And she said, how on earth did me being a woman uh, make me impossible to hate slavery just as much as you guys do. And so with this, she returns to the United States, she becomes a fervent uh, suffragette and she fights for the rights of women. And so they, these two women are going to um, help write the Declaration of Sentiments. The Declaration of Sentiments was a document that was based off the Declaration of Independence. And it actually kind of ironically plays at the Declaration of Independence, all of the places in which Thomas Jefferson wrote that all men's rights are created equal, right? She is going to say all men and women are created equal and they have the right to do all the things that men do, like the right to vote and hold office and hold property. Um, while the Seneca Falls Convention was largely ignored at the time, only 300 people attended, um, it set the stage for the modern feminist movement. And really the reason why it was you know, met on such deaf ears at the time is because of how strong the abolitionist movement was in the United States in this time period, this being right before the Civil War. However, after the Civil War, um, the basis of what the Seneca Falls Convention did kind of set the stage for um, more women's movements to come. Um, <clears throat> the aforementioned abolitionism. Um, abolitionism becomes a really hotly debated topic in the 17th century um, and coming into the 18th century as well, because obviously there is a very um, clear uh, bit of hypocrisy going on when Thomas Jefferson says that all men are created equal, given that Thomas Jefferson is a slaveholder. Um, and in fact, many of our founding fathers were slaveholders. And, and so therefore, the idea that um, all men are created equal just doesn't hold a lot of water unless you support abolitionism or the eradicating of slavery. And so um, we see in this early time period, um, the movement to end the Atlantic slave trade. And we know from 1450 to 1750, the major trade route in the world was that triangular trade going from Europe to Africa to the Americas and back to Europe. Um, that is our international slave trade. And so the thought process was um, to eradicate slavery, we must start by bringing slaves, stop 
stop the bringing of slaves from Africa to the Americas and abolitionism is going to rise and the international slave trade is going to be banned. Now, that's an important distinction. This is not the abolition of slavery in itself, but it is the abolition of the international slave trade. We are not bringing new slaves into the new world. First, it's banned in Denmark, Great Britain, and then January 1st of 1808 in the United States. Um, in many of those places, um, slavery is going to die as slaves are not continued to be brought into the country. For instance, um, slavery is going to die in Great Britain in the 1830s um, because it wasn't really a place where many slaves were brought to to begin with. Most of the um, s slaves that benefited Great Britain were, of course, in the Americas, um, and then the the products of their labor would come to Britain as a result. Um, but it continued in many places in the Americas, and why is that the case? Because the Americas were founded upon, uh, especially obviously the southern states and colonies were founded upon slave labor. And so the economy heavily tied to slave labor there. And so the Americas thus are going to have a much longer road to ab complete abolition than um, other places throughout the world. Um, the end of serfdom is also going to occur in this time period for the very same reasons of um, the ideas of the Enlightenment. Now, England had been early in abolishing serfdom. They did it before the Enlightenment, 1574. But in France, this is the end of serfdom um, because of the ideas of the Enlightenment. Um, we don't see the end of serfdom until in Russia until 1861. Um, and we know that when Russia finally abolishes its serfs, the last place to do so. This is the biggest emancipation in history, 23 million people emancipated um, as a result of this. And so the Enlightenment has a lot of positive um, effects on previously marginalized groups, serfs, slaves, and women. Um, speaking of marginalized groups, we also have um, treatment of Jews, which has, has obviously been a theme throughout our world history course so far about um, the discrimination and persecution against Jews. And Jews found it very difficult um, to preside in Europe between 1450 and 1750 because many of the monarchs who are claiming power um, from God are going to use their divine power to enforce their majority religion. For instance, in Spain, where we see Queen um, Isabella, King Ferdinand, um, with the Reconquista, they're going to push out all non-Catholics out of the country. And of course, this is going to affect Jews. And Jews are, are, are looking to find somewhere in which they can live peacefully, and they're finding it very difficult to do so. And so we have an Austro-Hungarian Jew, so a Jewish man in Austria-Hungary named Theodor Herzl. And Theodor Herzl says, um, there is no way in which we are going to find a state that is going to treat us with equality um, in which we deserve. And so he promotes establishing a homeland for Jews, a sanctuary, a Zion for Jews, um, where the Judaism religion started in the Middle East, the Holy Land, if you will. Um, and this is um, met with some um, success to, to some Jewish populations and other populations. Um, and it's actually momentum for this idea of Zionism is going to gain some ground because of an incident in France called the Dreyfus Affair. We have a um, French officer in the army, Alfred Dreyfus. Alfred Dreyfus is, um, he is thrown in jail for treason, um, that he allegedly passed documents to um, Prussia, which becomes Germany, a longtime foe of France. Um, to help them um, be successful in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, he's thrown in jail, and then it becomes clear afterwards that no, he actually didn't commit any treason, that the documents that he allegedly passed were forged. Um, and so what this whole incident proved was that um, there was anti-Semitism in France, and France was supposed to be one of the places in which Jews faced the least political obstacles. And so this, again, is going to lend itself to momentum towards Zionism. But of course, Zionism has its problems as well. And one of the biggest problems is that currently that holy land in which Jews want to establish 
a new homeland is controlled by um, Muslim people that have every right to believe that that is their home. The Ottoman Empire, we have Palestine Arabs living there. And so obviously we've seen that land fought over for hundreds and hundreds of years going back before the Crusades. And so um, this creates obviously some tensions um, between Muslims and Jews in this sense. Okay, so let's get into our revolution. So um, what are our causes of the American Revolution? Why did all of these British citizens living on the east coast of North America decide suddenly to um, move against King George III and the British Parliament and monarchy? Um, first, the ideas of the Enlightenment. This is huge. And, and a little bit of context on this one, guys. Um, we learned about the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War is a really big war. We talked about how the early colonizers of the North America, um, North America specifically, not all of the Americas, but North America, we had the British and the French. The British settled over there on the eastern um, coast, and then the French came over into Canada and moved down throughout um, the Ohio River Valley following the Beaver. Um, finally, these two countries are going to fight in the French and Indian War that starts in 1754, goes till 1763. The British are victorious, and they kick the French off the continent. But in doing so, um, they also, the English double their debt. They double their debt in protecting these colonies over there in the New World. And so logically then, Parliament and King George III says, well, we're in so far in debt, it makes sense that because we got in debt protecting those American colonies, that we should be able to tax them to make up our debts. And so they start passing taxes, the Sugar Act, uh, the Stamp Act, the Quartering Act, the Townsend Act, later on the Intolerable Acts, all of these laws that were for the purpose of um, bringing money back to Britain. But, of course, this is going to bring up a really, really deeply entrenched, ugly issue in specifically English political history. The fact of the matter is, is that none of our American colonies over in the New World are represented in British Parliament. That's a problem. And that's a problem because there has been fights over taxation in England for a long, long time. You remember, perhaps, that Charles I, the English monarch, supposed to be a divine king, tried to raise taxes, and he ended up getting his head cut off um, because he raised taxes without the consent of Parliament. The idea that the king couldn't raise taxes without the consent of Parliament goes back all the way to the Magna Carta in 1215. It was reinforced again by the Petition of Right. It's reinforced again by the English Bill of Rights in 1689. We have all of these things that stop the king from raising taxes on people without the consent of Parliament. And so it's then logical for our American colonists over here in the New World to say, since we don't have representation in Parliament, you cannot raise taxes against us. And so that is the line in the sand right there. And then they say, well, because of these ideas of natural rights, why is this king telling us what to do anyway? We've in fact been living over here in the Americas by ourselves without need of help since 1607 with the start of Jamestown. And so um, we have lots of different reasons here that are contributing to this anti-King George III sentiment, this anti-monarchy sentiment. And then there's the idea that King George III and the British Parliament are really regulating, controlling all of the American economy. They have these laws called the Navigation Acts, which force all of the natural materials that are being um, mined or created out of the um, eastern part of the United States, and they have to go to Britain. Everything of value has to go to Britain, and if they want to get manufactured goods from Britain, they have to pay in gold. And so what's happening is that um, these ideas of the Enlightenment and these ideas of the physiocrats, people like Adam Smith that are, are talking about how mercantilism is bad, well, they're living mercantilism. They're having to pass all of the wealth over to Britain. And so all of these things contribute to a deeply anti-British sentiment, um, especially because our colonial legislatures, meaning the legislatures of the colonies, all 13 colonies, have been ruling themselves since the very beginning. And now all of a sudden they're being told what to do. And this is going to lead to a uh, revolution against the British. Um, we see July 4th, 1776, a key date. This is when Thomas Jefferson really writes the document. In fact, um, the actual Declaration of Independence, it actually occurred two days previous from Richard Henry Lee, which was uh, 
but there needed to be written proof of this. And so, of course, the document is written by a 33-year-old Virginia lawyer, Thomas Jefferson, of course, becomes our third president of the United States. He states independence of the American colonies. Um, many of the things written in this document are taken directly from the philosophes, from the Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, like the life of liberty and the pursuit of happiness of course that line life liberty and the pursuit of happiness um exactly taken from john locke who said life liberty and the pursuit of property and so um this of course is our start of revolution season 1776 and we fight ourselves a revolutionary war notice actually the war started in 1775 in april with lexington and concord um but we don't declare our independence until the following year um okay so of course, we don't talk a lot about the American Revolution in this class. It is a big, big shame. Uh, however, when you take a push next year, we will talk a lot about the American independence movement. Um, the one thing that we have to know from this one is that the French are absolutely critical in the Americans winning this war and getting their independence. Um, look, to say that the Americans helped uh, excuse me, that the French came in and helped the Americans beat the British would be like saying daddy and I killed the bear and the French are daddy because the French guys are going to provide almost all of the guns, ammunitions, money, half the army for the Americans and the entire Navy. The French are going to come in and defeat the British with a little bit of help of our American revolutionaries. And that is what is going to bring independence in 1783, validated by the Treaty of Paris, giving our 13 colonies um, independence from Britain. Um, of course, the French here, why would the French come in and help the Americans? The French had just been kicked off the continent with our French and Indian War by these same British. And so the French are getting a measure of revenge here by saying, okay, well, if we're kicked off the continent, then you're gonna be kicked off the continent too. But the French make this alliance with the Americans thinking that the Americans now are going to come in and help the French if they get to ever get into some political disputes as well. Unfortunately, the Americans are not gonna honor this alliance and it's gonna create some serious problems um, when the French come into their own revolution, which is, is coming up very, very quickly. Um, our U.S. Constitution. Our U.S. Constitution um, is dripping in the Enlightenment. It has so many aspects of natural rights, which were brought to us by many of those philosophes, those Enlightenment thinkers. We have a republic, of course, which is... Um, representatives that are elected by the people. Um, we have three branches of government. Therefore, we have a separation of powers. That separation of powers was introduced by Baron Montesquieu, a philosopher. Um, two houses, that's what a bicameral legislature means, the House of Representatives and the Senate, both of which, of course, are carrying out the general will of the people, which was what Rousseau said. Um, uh, obviously, the executive is elected by the people. And then we have checks and balances on each part of the um, Government. Um, also, the Bill of Rights is a big one, which is added to the Constitution in 1791. It's our first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And these are where our, most of our civil liberties are found, um, our protections against the government, uh, just as the American colonists wanted protections from King George III. The American people guaranteed protections from their own government. That's called civil liberties. And here they are in the Bill of Rights, things like your freedom of religion, speech, press, etc assembly petition, the right to bear arms, um, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, a speedy trial, all of those things. Okay, so the French Revolution, let's get right into it. So our French, um, we have a major causes for the French Revolution. Um, the biggest being um, really two things, one and two right there. Um, the Enlightenment ideas. And in fact, many of our philosophes were French, um, and they are coming from France specifically, because France is where you see a lot uh, more of inequity of power. Um, let's revisit the French political and um, economic structure, shall we? So over in France, we have seen the rising power of monarch for some time. For instance, King Louis XIV is the most powerful monarch 
perhaps in European history. He ruled as an absolute leader. He said, I am the state. I make the laws. I make the decisions. Um, he moved the nobles to the palace of Versailles so he could keep a watch over them. And so he really dictated all of the politics of France. Um, also, all of the expensive wars that King Louis XIV got in or the building of the Palace of Versailles, all of these things take a tremendous amount of money. And who pays for things in France? Well, the, second is, the first estate, the clergy don't pay any taxes. The second estate, the nobles don't pay any taxes. It is instead the bourgeoisie, the rest of the country, the third estate that pay all of the taxes. And so we see tr terrible inequity when it comes to both politics and economics in France. And this is leading to serious economic trouble. Um, and for a lot of reasons, you're not collecting taxes from the richest people in, in the country. Also, you've gone to some several really expensive wars with Great Britain, such as the French and Indian War. Then you went out and supported the Americans in their revolution. You came in, you, you sent money, you sent guns, you sent an army, you sent a navy, you sent all of these resources that of course take money. And then, you doubled your own debt in the process, and now you desperately, desperately need money. And so that is where our French Revolution kind of kicks off right here. And you can see if you're a visual person, the visual breakdown of the French society, that the population is 98% the third estates. Um, and yet when we look over to land ownership, um, we see that this 1.5% who are nobility and our 0.5% which are clergy um, have a much disproportionate amount of land that they control. They can control far more land than their population. And of course, they're not taxed. Only the third estate is taxed. Um, we also are being led at this time by some really poor leadership. Um, and the best example of which is Louis the 16th. He is very indecisive. He has no understanding um, of the momentous uh, occasion of what has what has happened, that these Enlightenment ideals are circulating, and that he must be careful and and give some rights to his people. He pays little attention to his advisors, and this will be his downfall. And his wife Marie Antoinette, she's Austrian. Um, Austria and France have gone head to head in several wars, and so she's already unpopular because of his nation her nationality. She also is always wearing the most expensive gowns and jewels. Um, um, which, of course, the people know were paid for by them um, because they pay all the taxes. She was ironically called Madame Deficit. And these leaders, of course, are going to lead to lots of unpopularity in France. Um, okay, the fateful occasion that starts the French Revolution is the calling of the Estates General by King Louis XVI. The Estates General is the French Congress. But unlike the British Parliament, the, French, the Estates General only meets when the king calls it. Um, the British Parliament meets regularly. It's like our American Congress. The French Congress, the Estates General, only meets when the king calls it. And it hasn't been called in since 1626. There's been no need because the kings have been making all the decisions themselves. But here we are in 1789 and Louis the 16th needs money. He really desperately needs money. And so he is going to call upon a meeting of the Estates General to decide what to do about the dire straits economic situation that they're in. Now, so he actually has in mind um, perhaps changing the tax structure, which obviously needs to be changed. But he insists upon traditional voting styles, which makes absolutely no sense. It's a boneheaded move because if you do that, then you only allow one vote per state. Now, of course, 98% of the population is the third estate. But if you only allow one vote per estate, then, of course, the nobles and the clergy can always outvote the third estate. And that's exactly what happens here. The question of taxation comes up. Should we change tax systems so that the nobles and the clergy pay taxes? Of course, the nobles and the clergy say, no, we don't want to pay taxes. The third estate says they should pay taxes. They're outvoted two to one. And so finally, the third estate has had enough and they are going to leave um, and they are going to form a new government called the National Assembly. Technically illegal, of course, because there's nowhere in French law that says that they can do this. So this really is the start of the revolution. They are creating a new government and they are creating this government for the purpose of getting some reform um, to limit the power of the king. And this is really, while it's radical, it, it is a 
relatively moderate part of the revolution because the National Assembly isn't calling for the king's head. They're just calling for changes to the government. Now, of course, what ensues afterwards becomes radical because the National Assembly starts meeting in Paris, they start coming up with these new ideas, and then the king threatens to arrest them. So then the citizens of France are going to say, okay, we're going to have to defend ourselves against the king, so they are going to go and search for weapons. This idea of storming of the Bastille, which is very similar to our Lexington and Concord part of uh, the American Revolutionary Wars, where the citizens are looking to defend themselves. They need weapons to do so. So they storm this French prison called the Bastille. Um, they kill the guards. They place their heads on spikes. They march through the cities and the towns of Paris, um, waving these heads up in the air. Uh, the kind of the symbol that the revolution has occurred and that they were no longer stand for tyranny in their country. Um, um, today, this is celebrated like their Independence Day. This is Bastille Day on July 14th. Um, this, the same thing is going to happen in the countryside French. France still very agricultural at this stage. And so um, we have peasants that are going to rise up against their nobles or, or our serfs in France that are going to rise up against their nobles, um, seize the papers that bind them to the land, tear them up. Um, nobles are going to have to run for it. They're going to have to get out of there rather than being killed like the prison guards of the Bastille. And so truly now we have uh, a revolution in France um, and the National Assembly is, is going to make some changes. Um, they're going to officially abolish feudalism and they're going to declare their rights with something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man, that all the, the rights of all males are universal. And yes, they specify males, which is going to frustrate, obviously, the female population of France. Um, but at this stage, Louis XVI has a choice. He has um, either he acknowledges these changes and remains as the king or he doesn't. And now we have a, a big problem of, of having to fight against the third estate. Um, Louis and the nobles refuse to accept this new government. And this is where things turn more radical because the radicals, the Jacobins now, are going to declare themselves the leaders of the country and they are going to enforce radical change upon the um, French um, political structure by creating the first French Republic. Um, just by the creation of this new government, they have um, really become a rebellious government because they are not acknowledging the power of the king. And in fact, they are going to accuse the king of treachery. Um, and this then is going to lead to the execution of King Louis the 16th in 1793. Um, there is a committee as part of this first French Republic called the Committee of Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety is, in fact, the most ironic name in the history of, of the world um, because it is it is nothing. Um, it is certainly not keeping public safety. It is there to root out counter revolutionaries. What that means is they are the revolutionaries. They are rebelling against the king. Anyone against them rebelling against the king needs to be put to death. And the symbol of this era, this reign of terror of the French Revolution uh, is the guillotine in which thousands, tens of thousands are executed um, between 1793 and 1795. A very, very dangerous time, obviously, in French history. Um, the leader of this committee of, of public safety is the Frenchman Maximilien Robespierre, who leads the Jacobins, these radicals, um, in their killing of, of counter-revolutionaries. Um, Louis the Sixteenth is executed in 1793. Marie Antoinette killed the following year. Um, and so this is obviously um, the reign of terror. Um, one person who meets her demise by guillotine is Olympe de Gouges. Olympe de Gouges is a feminist in France, and she just comes in, unfortunately, at the very wrong time um, because the French had come out with the Declaration of Rights of Man. She says, well, I'm going to write then the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. This is very much like the Seneca Falls Convention with our Declaration of Sentiments. And she said that French women should have the same political rights as men. Unfortunately, um, all of the leaders of the Jacobins were men. She is labeled as a counter-revolutionary and she is executed by guillotine as well. Very sad. Um, eventually, calmer heads prevail. The moderates regain control, taking that from the Jacobins. They behead Maximilian Robespierre. Um, and then 
um, as France is gaining more political power for the individual. Um, there is a pride in France that we have uh, rid ourselves of the monarchy, um, the corrupt monarchy, and French nationalism is growing. We should have a, a powerful democracy in which all French people have a voice. Um, and they turn to a very popular French young leader named Napoleon Bonaparte, who um, becomes the, ironically, the dictator of France for the next 10 years. Um, but unfortunately, Napoleon is no longer part of our curriculum. Um, all, all we can really say at the end of this long revolution is that, in fact, he becomes an emperor. And so, in fact, we don't have a democracy after all of this. After 15 years of fighting, we have an emperor in France and not a democracy. Um, however, uh, Napoleon does allow far expanded rights for the individual, which, of course, the French monarchy was not allowing. He also allows a change in the tax system, which obviously was one of the big reasons um, in a revolution to begin with. Okay, um, here is the Haitian Revolution. Um, and when we look at Haiti, uh, Haiti is in the Caribbean. Um, our college board calls this Latin America. Um, and this is a French controlled island. Um, and it is a, obviously an island that is used in mercantilism. Um, the triangular trade uh, is perfect context for this revolution because we see slaves coming from Western Africa to work on these sugar plantations and to a lesser extent caught uh, coffee plantations. Um, then um, that sugar and coffee brought back to France um, and then manufactured goods sold back to Africa and the process goes on and on and on. Um, therefore, Haiti has lots of slaves, lots of slaves to work on these sugar plantations. Um, but then the French Revolution occurs. And so the French Revolution, we have this Declaration of Rights of Men that all declares all men created equal. And so that is going to uh, really create the context of a revolution here in Haiti because um, it then, of course, we have slavery in Haiti. And so we have slaves that are going to say, well, we're supposed to be equal. And so the conditions are we have the sugar and coffee colony and we have these Maroons who are escaped African slaves all throughout the Caribbean. We've talked about Maroons before, like in Jamaica, um, and they're living outside of these plantations in secret. They're living with the Native Americans, the, the people of the, the Caribbean. They're called the Tainos. Um, and then then they are going to hear about news of the American and the French revolutions and say, this is our time to revolt ourselves. And so um, in 1791, the Maroons are going to strike back against their plantations. Um, they are going to kill the former plantation um, owners, their former masters, and um, launch a massive slave rebellion in Haiti, this, uh, the French call it Saint Domingue, um, and they conquer the island for themselves. And they're led by this man, Toussaint Louverture, who is a former French slave who is educated in the ideals of the Enlightenment. And um, he is going to lead this revolution, create a new constitution. Haiti is now independent from France. He is the governor of life. All citizens have equality and citizenship. And because so much of the country had no land at all. They had no land. They were slaves. They had no land or property or anything. Um, he is going to divide up all these plantations and give the land out to these former slaves. This is a division of land, unlike any of the other revolutions, because um, this is now giving land to people that had no land previously. Um, but this is kind of like our Declaration of Independence, right? Haiti has declared their independence. They've created a new constitution, but now they're going to have to fight for it um, because the French are not going to give up their colonies so easily. Napoleon in power in France says, we'll recognize your independence, but Louverture has to come over and negotiate with us. Napoleon lies. He has him captured and arrested. He's executed. But France fails to take over Saint-Domingue once again. Um, Jean-Jacques Dessalines replaces Toussaint Louverture. Um, he rules over Saint-Domingue, over Haiti, um, and he keeps them safe from French reinforcements. Um, also, yellow fever is a huge weapon for the Haitians because the French have no immunity to this disease and many die. Um, Napoleon finally gets very frustrated. He has plans to take over Europe, and so he decides to abandon 
um, recapturing San Domingue. And so Haiti becomes an independent state. And they're the first of uh, three things. They're the first country in Latin America to win their independence from a European controller. And many, many will follow suit afterwards. They're the first post-colonial, meaning they were a colony, now they're not, independent black-led country in the world, and the only country ever to become independent from a slave uprising. Um, I have more to do, um, but I have to teach a class now, so I'm going to pause this and then finish up uh, when I am done with my class, which will be very soon. So hope you guys are having a good morning. Um, and I hope you're enjoying some revolutionary talk. Talk to you guys um, in just a little bit.